This is Khat Chronicles, design stories from the Arab world, presented to you in collaboration with Afikra. I am Yara Khouri Namour, and I have here with me today... Pascal Zorbi. So let's start with the first typical question. When and why did you decide to become a designer? What was the first decision as a graphic designer? Well, actually, How? it came by chance because when I finished my studies, my uh, school, I wanted to be actually an artist. And I applied for the Lebanese University in the art department. And there was three exams, the drawing exam, the English exam, and the French exam, uh, English-Arabic. And so I did well with the drawing exam, but I didn't do in the language exams because I'm terrible with languages. And when the listing came, they only took the first 25 and it was like 27 or 20 oh. whatever out of like to whatever 100 or whatever they were applying so i went back and i said okay i said to my parents uh, i wasn't accepted what shall i do i said yeah why don't you apply to this graphic design career whatever there's this and you i didn't know anything actually that's about not a dame university not a dame university mm-hmm so the higher arts you wanted and then you yeah you because i was the commercial learning arts <laughs> yeah I ended up in NDU by just having to take option B and doing graphic design. But then I think I was lucky to have taken option B. I was lucky to have you as a teacher and other uh, respectable teachers like John and uh, Nadim. John Kurdbawi. John Kurdbawi. And Nadim Matta. Nadim Matta. Mm-hmm. I realized how I am so uh, interested in letters and typography very late, but I knew how... Really, like, I, I'm very bad in languages, but I have this crazy love or uh, intriguement to, to, to letter forms, to mm. shapes, to these abstract forms and phonetics. And I discovered this during so my, your, your during trip my to, bachelor mm-hmm, and, and you. Okay. And so the, uh, how did, why and when did you decide to go to do your master's? Yeah, doing my master's came quite after, so I had to work for around four years, basically to make up some money to mm-hmm. go and make my master's. And while I was working, actually it's good that I started working, because when I started working, I realized that how much limiting is the typographical, uh, the type design field, like uh, the choice of the Arabic fonts, etc. And you're always uh, struggling with bilingual publications or design approaches. And also, uh, from the different companies I jumped from, from, the employer noticed directly that I have this uh, keen eye on typography, and I ended up always doing like the logotypes or the typography layout setting, or I'm, I was the one who was worried about the leading curling and, and leading and widows and orphans and the spacing of this font and the width. So, so mm. I noticed that, yeah, maybe this is my, this is my interest. That's your call. And when it came Why, to... How did you decide which program to go to? Well, when I decided to do something about type and typography, I made a research. Mm-hmm. And I ended up knowing that there's the Reading uh, program. There was a program in Switzerland. There was the program in, in uh, New York. But beside that, there was nothing. And then I found KABK also in Holland. But back then, it wasn't yet much many uh, advertised it wasn't very popular as it is now mm. um, and it wasn't yet uh, an accredited master program mm-hmm. actually when I started in the same year that I was there it was accredited so I was lucky that it became a design pro- a master's in design program before it wasn't it's all... so anyways I ended up finding it and also it was my option B like mm. the option B of <laughs> being a graphic designer simply because I cannot afford to go to Reading Mm. Uh, simply, I from working uh, horribly over over time in Beirut with my horrible salaries, I wasn't able to make enough money to pay to go and live in Reading for one year and pay X amount of pounds. Mm. And I said, yeah, let's go to The Hague. I, mm. I, I didn't know much about it. You jumped on a plane. And... I also jumped on a plane. It wasn't the first time I traveled out of Lebanon alone. My parents were like freaked out. I'm going to where? To Holland? I'm going to Amsterdam, where there's naked women in the, in the, in the windows and they, 
and they smoke hash on the road and they, what what are you <laughs> we're going? gonna lose our son <laughs> what what are you going to masters in typography what's typography well, stay here and maybe work some more and then anyways all of this drama and no one knew why i was doing that i was a bit like just going to this unknown type program well it did you good it did me good also When you came back, what did you do, actually? Where did you work? Uh, did you set up your own uh, When I came back, I practice? didn't want to work with the company again. Even in Amsterdam, I had some offers to work, but I said, I noticed that if I'm going to be employed again, I'm going to lose the chance to make something new in the type design community. And I said, no, I'm not going back to being... First, I don't want to be back employed in any company. I don't want anyone to tell me what... I have to do when I have to do it. So, and this hierarchy of companies, I'm totally against it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't see it. It should be how it should be. I was lucky that I was able to teach at Notre Dame University, and also allowed me to have some bit of cash coming in uh, every month, and allows me allowed me to not be directly strong myself into a job to get a salary. And I was part-time teaching and part-time starting own starting up my own uh, type design business. And I made this graffiti research and I collaborated with a colleague of mine, Don Carr, from Berlin. And after four years, we published a book about Arabic graffiti in the Middle East, whatever, whatever. What was the latest TV show that you enjoyed? The latest actually... W- what, whatever it was, banal it is, it doesn't no, matter. No, no, whatever banal, it was interesting actually. Uh, It was a five-episode series on HBO. It's called oh. Chernobyl. Mm-hmm. And it was mind-blowing, actually, to know what happened exactly in Chernobyl. So uh, are you reading books? Uh, yes, I am. Actually, the last book I read... It's a bit funny. Actually, the last book I read was my first Spanish book. And now wow. I finished just my first Spanish book because I'm learning Spanish now, living in Madrid. Um, how would you describe your specialization or focus in design? What... What do you specialize in? First, I have to say that I'm still learning about type design. I always try to challenge myself and actually a bit challenge the type design community. There was always these debates about what should be done and how it should be done and what is the correct way or what is the wrong way or what is... This is how it should be done. This is not how, how it should be done. The references is. used, the references, for example. Yeah. And without going into details or about mm-hmm. different kind of scores or names, I always feel that... I don't belong to either of these. I'm somewhere in between, or maybe I'm something different than them. And or and something believe, inspires you in this at that I, po- point, yeah. and something else inspires you in that. And exactly, and it doesn't. And there's so many different factors that makes you design a new typeface. It might be that you want to make your own research about some some project and come with a typeface, or it can be a briefing from a client about a bespoke font, or it can be a something you saw uh, on the street one day and you want to make it. Whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It, I try to be daring, I try to be uh, challenging, mm-hmm. I try to challenge myself first. I try to do every time stuff that makes me learn something new and makes me reinvent myself and my typefaces. What would be the project you would be most proud of? I would have to say that what I'm working now is the... So now we are working on the Zed, uh Super Family. Yeah. And I'm really proud of what I'm working on with my collaborators. Um, I will Can say we because it? I'm not only alone because I do the Arabic and I do I do I work with other type designers that are experts in Latin and maybe also some sometimes I get help in the Arabic. So I work with type designers in Berlin and Amsterdam and in Switzerland and in Lebanon. So and tell us more about Zert. Zert it's really becoming a really nice, super challenging fun type family. It's still family. growing. It's still going to be growing until end of the year, maybe until next year. It start, Zared started uh, in 2008. What it. does it mean? And Zared means strong. Something that you can be... Depend on. Dependent or... on. Something reliable, something strong. Um, Zared. Okay. So that was the name. And then after uh, three years, I said, okay... Uh, After seeing that how the newspaper, because this was basically like a newspaper typeface, and then when you did the different weights, it became more like not only headlines, can be also used for text, but it's very edgy, it's very... Sharp. Sharp, very edgy, very... The problem with Zared at the beginning, it was very stylized. Mm. And we were getting some complaints that 
it's not very nice for small copy text. It's not very, sometimes not very readable, very legible, but okay. Let's look again into this font. So we went back, we fixed it a bit. We made it less edgy, less sharp. Easier to read. Easier to read. And then we, we added a lot of ligatures to it. And then we said, okay, let's now make it big. And then it became, the Zerit became Zerit Serif. Mm. And then we said, okay, now we're going to make Zerit Text, Zerit Sans. Then we did Zerit Slab. And then we did Zerit Display. If you, if you think in sim simplistically and say, okay, I met someone now and I'm going to tell them what I do. Ah, and they yes. ask you, uh, Pascal, what do you do? How do you explain to them what you do and well, or or show the relevance of what you do? I mean, sometimes it could be that it's very... Well, until now, there's still some family members and friends that they don't know actually what I do. And how... Well, how do you explain it to them? I spend all of my time just doing this thing of, of doing letters? They still don't understand this. So explain. Let's, what? I'm your grandma. <laughs> explain to me, Pascal. The easiest way to, to explain is how, like, you say, like, maybe bread and water are the essence of the food. The same way in the communication system or business, you cannot live without a typeface, without a font. What is a font? A font is a group of letters put together in this digital coded kind of I, file. I lost you there. <laughs> okay, it's a... So, explain it to me. What do you do, Pascal? Basically, whatever I see around, every time I have this question of my grandpa or a friend, mm -hmm. I look just around, I see what are the products that have type on them. Mm -hmm. Looking at the table now in front of us, there's so many stuff with type. I just tell them, look here, look here, look here, look here, look mm here. -hmm. This would not be possible if there wasn't this type on it. And this type, there's people like me who spend who, who spend hours, hours doing it. Yeah. And it doesn't exist by magic on computers. There's actually people who spend hours and hours doing this and they don't exist only on computers by default. That's Some people way. are doing it. So... That's a good way to do it. In retrospect, Pascal, what do you what project you feel got you the most recognition? I think the main one that was a shift was the first. It was when I was uh, working on the first uh, Google project for the Droid font, uh, mm -hmm. and then it became now the Noto. It was the Arabic font for the Noto project. Before it was called Droid, but now it became Noto. It's this project that Google is doing by to support all the languages in all the world. And it was the first time I was contacted by an international com company because before I was only contacted by local or Arab companies. Regional. Regional. Ones. Hmm. And this was the first exposure to me that, okay, it seems it, I am getting, I'm getting <laughs> to these world international companies. They know about this silly guy in Beirut doing typefaces. So. Far from silly. So, <laughs> so, yeah. And it was the first time I got a glimpse of this world of bespoke corporate funds and licensing. And When you look at the process that you work with, what is the stage you might find most difficult? Type design is, it's a word by itself. It lives in it. Like, it's not linked to really any other design. Discipline. Discipline. Uh, the first part somehow is, but then it goes really into technical. So if there's like creative part and then there's the technical part, the creative part, which I really enjoy, it's not as big enough to enjoy it. Mm. And as long as you want, as much as the heavy technical part. So the fun part for me is the first 10 to 20% maximum. There's the other 90% of making it a final typeface that have to work on all the platforms and you have to add all the features and all the coding and all the ligatures. And that's where the marathon starts. That's, that's when the marathon starts and, and it's a bit tedious. And to keep up the uh, excitement to actually finish it and publish exactly. it, it can, is, is hard. It, yeah, it can become that's meta. So if you... Uh, want to think in retrospect again. Why do you feel that what you do is important? I feel I am able to contribute to the Arab the type design community. And this makes me uh, just happy knowing that. That I'm able to 
give to a community in my own ex- expertise back then do you wasn't. think do you think that is part uh, of something you left uh, for designers like a legacy how would you like to be remembered actually i don't know maybe i would i like to be remembered that this uh, well i am a type designer as as you were mentioning and what I was saying, but maybe this is not what distinguishes me. Uh, maybe that I always challenge the notion of what is Arab design and how it should be. And that's your graffiti piece, right? Man huwa al-Arabi? Come in. Yeah. No? Wasn't This it is that? bigger than all type design. This is who yes. is the Arab, man huwa al-Arabi. And that identity so, you're trying to find? This is the first graffiti I, I did when I came back to Lebanon. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And I had a big question about what is an Arab in all different kind of aspects of it socially career wise religiously politically uh, it's a very big question and internationally yeah it's yeah. yeah man who are Arabi it's like a big a very like only a question made of three words but actually it's very big and you can speak about it for hours yeah Pascal after this conversation what do you imagine will be important in type design in the coming 10, 20 years, in the future? Yeah, I think what is interesting is that the type design technology is moving in parallel with the with the, all the new media, uh, online technologies, and it's becoming somehow more hand-in-hand <clears throat> as it was previously with the print technology. So. Um, now what we saw in the, these two years and now it's still developing is this new technology called variable fonts which is going to be basically the foundation for all the new media this allows the typeface to be responsive as, as a responsive design can be so now for example when you do a website uh, it has to be responsive on desktop, mobile and tablet mm-hmm. big, small size width changes and so the fonts are also going to be responsive, are going to be changeable. They're going to be more kind of a... Customized for the viewer? Custom, or? flexible fonts that change or adapt to the needs of the, of the viewer. Mm-hmm. Simply to help legibility or maybe to do a, some kind of a funky animation. This or is maybe now. To, this this, this is, is now. now. I, I, and do you, th- how do you see it happening in 20 years, let's say? But I think this to be mature mm-hmm. enough is going to be in the coming 10 mm-hmm. years. But I think also what's coming to happen in 10 years is all the business of the type. We are now moving more from licensing fonts to renting fonts or subscribing to fonts. We are moving more to fonts should be more present and available under the hand tips of the viewer, the customer. You can edit, you can change, you can. So I think this idea of the type is the bread of the communication like mm-hmm. this metaphor we did at the beginning is going to be even more uh, present and the idea of accessing typefaces and working with them is going to be much more easier i think people will start knowing more about what are phones than now and start understanding more what they are okay but what is the big important design you mean in design or in technology in type design we're talking or and technology, if you see the technology has a part, of course it does. In type design, what before in the past 15 years, somehow I was only focusing on Arabic type. Uh, since five years, I'm focusing on multilingual Arabic Latin typefaces. And now it seems that it's not enough to be mm. only a specialist in only Arabic and Latin. And because of we live in this global uh, village, uh, now the standard, or in the coming years, the standard will be that you, if you want to make a typeface, it has to be Latin, Arabic, uh, Cyrillic, Indian, uh, Cyrillic, Greek, whatever, just, just to be the just to be the that's standard. That's the minimum platform just, you start just to with. Be the, yeah, and and uh, this is also a big challenge about what will be, and this is also part of our growing. And that I think technology. cannot happen without collaborations. This cannot happen. Uh, this is not uh, islands on their own. True. Okay. So there's going to be more collaboration with type designers, type communities. So when you talk about yeah. variable fonts yeah. and uh, their connection with uh, the web, yeah. let's go a step backward and say, do you think print is dead? 
Is there the end of? Is that the end of print? Well, they were saying print is dead back in the nineties, and then it yeah. happened. So, I don't think it's going to be dead, but I think all the publications are finding it hard now to compete with the hand mobile devices or or laptops, and they're realizing that the print editions will get less and less. Mm-hmm. Maybe I think the mass media will lose the print, but doesn't mean that we're going to use the books and uh, or lose, valuable maybe. prints. L- l- lose. lose. Mm. So maybe like the newspapers, maybe in ten or five years they will stop doing any print editions. But of course you can still buy books, like mm. or special editions of art books. Or whatever. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, I think I think it will still be. So I don't think it's going to be the death of print, but I think it's going to be more the evolution of our communication systems and mm. the screen will take over at some point, of course. Pascal, I have with me here, uh, you just gave me uh, a type specimen, 29 letters, t- latest type specimen, and it looks beautiful. And it's called Aujuh al-Harif, the multiple facets of the letter. And you told me that it's at the same time a journal, right? Yeah, we try to uh, make our type specimen uh, be readable and be interesting for our uh, clients who wants to 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 purchase it, not only to have a, a preview of the fonts, but also to have very nice content to read and to get to know more about uh, certain aspects of language or letters or type or mm-hmm. that links to type design. And you're gonna do it every year. And it's going to be annual. Every year, by the end of the year, we're going to make a new publication with a new team, with a new collected uh, or written or found material about a certain topic. And it's going to be typeset with the latest fonts that we did in, during this year. Nice. Very interesting. And uh, it makes it like a design, typographical. Also. Yeah, it's only using typography. There's no images. It speaks about topic. Uh, yeah, hopefully it becomes like a, like a, like a collectible design, a small journal. And also our typefaces are shown in it. Nice. And um, there's something that strikes my eye here. And I see in Bukra. Is it Bukra? That yeah. you've actually sort of designed uh, um, uh, the slanted, you call it the slanted version, but you've designed a quite a, a fascinating uh, slanted version. Can you tell us more about what happened here? It changed quite a lot from the regular yeah, to the slant. So the idea was that how we are going to start do, uh, developing italic or slanted versions of our Arabic font. And we didn't want to just slant them because this would be like the horrible, the horrible way of doing it. And also to distinguish ourselves from, from other uh, typefaces that have just slanted. Uh, I, have, I had to go back to, to, uh, to manuscripts, to a bit of research, and to understand what would be the proper slanted version or italic version of a certain typeface. Historical references. Historical references. And this, since Bukhara was created based on the modern Kufi, it's just very geometric font that's based on the modern Kufi and it's very uh, somehow uh, modular in its approach. Uh, And going back to history, the Kufi, there's different kind of Kufic Kufic uh, styles and there's the old Kufi, there's the Eastern Kufi, there's the modern Kufi, there's the Maghribi Kufi, etc. And since Bukra was the modern, we tried to find what other Kufic structure were drawn with a slant in them, present in them. And this was the Eastern Kufi. Mm-hmm. And in the Eastern Kufi, there's a natural slant to it, to the left, from the right to the left. And it doesn't only come with a slant, it comes with a, dif- with a total change of the letter form and of the structure of some letters. Mm-hmm. And the starting pen stroke, ending pen stroke of the overall structure of the letter. So actually the slanted version of Bukra, it's not a slanted version of Bukra, it's a redesign of Bukra to be slanted. Sort of a true italic, right? Sort of a true italic, if, yeah, if you want to compare it to Latin. Beautiful. So this was the the notion behind and it. Where can some uh, one find these uh, um, specimens? So the type specimen at the moment is only available when uh, I go to talks and lectures. But there's a new website coming, hopefully by the fall of 2019, with a new brand identity. We are rebranding ourselves and we're launching a new website 
and from this new website you can order uh, online and it will be shipped for you all over the world beautiful beautiful piece and uh, definitely a collectible for me at least hopefully and for the students (laughs) (laughs) just to wrap things up do you have any final thoughts you would like to leave us with be part of a community and be daring don't be scared of doing new stuff but before doing that please understand the old stuff the history the history because you cannot do anything new if you don't understand it well and the big problem is that what we're seeing now in the Arab community that so many, so many people they are doing some new stuff that don't have enough knowledge about the past and it's having a bad impact on the design community well thank you very much Pascal thank very you. much thank you for having me Thank you for listening. This was Khat Chronicles, design stories from the Arab world. 